uh, welcome to sad stage. Uh, main stage is bigger, has beautiful light and so on, but we all know that this is the good stage. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Luna, uh, the host of uh, Lunaticoin, a Spanish uh, Bitcoin podcast. And uh, yeah, I, I should do now like 10 minutes opening words. It will be for sure less. I didn't prepare anything, but I know what I want to talk about. Uh, three years ago, uh, I came here. Uh, it was like a dream to come here. You know, I was a pleb. I was starting my humble podcast. And, um, and this experience changed my life. I got to meet uh, a lot of people. Uh, it, you will see, if it's your first time, you will see that you can speak with anybody you want. And that mentality and the possibilities, everything what I learned there changed my life for, for sure for the next month in that year. But I think I'm still having the, the power that I got from 2019. And now listening to Giacomo, I felt it again. I feel like uh, the, the my first conference. It's, it's not the first anymore. Maybe it's the fourth or something like this. But uh, yeah, this is, if it's your first time, I hope that you experience something like this. And just another thing before I shut up, um, that in your bags, if you didn't took your bag, there is something like this. And when I came in 2019, I fill it up, like uh, at least half. I, I was noting, I was uh, like hectic, everything. Somebody was talking, Novak was talking, oh, doing this, uh, somebody else. Blah, blah. And this book, I still have it and I still check it for ideas because it has all of them, all, all the original ideas, no? So I encourage you to do the same. And aside from that, uh, just one reminder, just be mindful about privacy. This is one of the first times that I show myself the most. Some people know me here, and normally I go with masks and so on. Uh, you can do pictures. I know where I am. I know I will, I'm being recorded. For me, it's no problem. But just be mindful with uh, other people. Maybe they don't want to be on camera. So whenever you do a picture, maybe you can ask. Uh, do you mind if uh, you are in the picture? And aside from that, just as uh, Max, say, uh, Max said before, Enjoy, learn a lot, and now I want to introduce my now friend because he became fam yesterday night, <laughs> and he's a great guy. Uh, he has a nice sense of humor, and uh, and he's gonna talk uh, about uh, DLCs, uh, uh, what is a very interesting topic. So please, let's all welcome Daniel. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yo yo! Wow, that's pretty loud. Hello. Ooh, tough crowd. No. Um, yeah, so FAC central exchanges. Since uh, Giacomo already used FAC on stage, I can actually say FAC. Originally, I wanted to say, like, you're not supposed to use the F word, right? So it's probably fake central exchanges because they're all fake. Most of them are just bookkeeping. Um, but in this case, FAC central exchanges, still sees for the win. Why? Why don't I like uh, centralized exchanges? Well, it's mostly because of the Bitcoin ethos. Bitcoin is sound money. Smarter people than me have said that. And sound money means that you are in control and nobody else can take control over your money. Control is kind of the interesting thing and Giacomo has been leading into this whole topic nicely, talking about freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of money, right? But at the same time, you know, I don't want my Bitcoin to just sit around. I want to invest my Bitcoin, yeah? Like, I, I like holding, yeah? I, it's, a, it's a cool concept. But I want to grow my Bitcoin, actually, right? I and I want to grow my Bitcoin out of more, like, out of Bitcoin. Yeah? I don't want to go into shit coins, but I want to be able to say, hey, I have Bitcoin, and I want to grow those, yeah? And then I go to one of these, well, exchanges to trade, you know? And remember when you had funds on empty Gox? And it's gone. And remember when there was any other exchange hack? And it's gone. And remember recently when they asked for your ID and all of those jurisdictions started changing and you ha had to start like paying taxes and it's being harder and harder to have crypto. You have to move around in the world to still use it. And it's gone. Don't trust humans, trust the chain. That's kind of the point of Bitcoin, right? And you trust the Bitcoin protocol. You trust it with like having your coins. But when it comes to trading, you still use centralized exchanges and almost everybody does. But you don't have to because there's something called non-custodial trading. And in non-custodial trading, you don't know your trading partner. You don't have to know your trading partner. You can opt if you want. You don't trust your trading partner, but you trust an on-chain protocol. 
very similar to what Bitcoin stands for, right? We trust the Bitcoin protocol because it is open source. You can actually have a look, you can even contribute. That's the same for non-custodial trading solutions. If a non-custodial trading solution is not open source, don't touch it. That's the first rule. <laughs> for exchanging assets, <coughs> just mentioning here because people in the crowd might know, you have HDLCs, hash time lock contracts, PTLCs, point time lock contracts. For trading assets, you can use DLCs, discrete lock contracts. So what is a DLC? What is this thing? A DLC is basically a multisig, and then you have, you distribute from said multisig, so two people meet, yeah, lock up money, then you distribute from said multisig according to event happening in the real world. Okay, let's have an example. Recently I walked around, yeah, I met Vitalik in the street, it was like, dude, Vitalik, what's up with this Ethereum roller coaster? What, what the hell is this weird merch thing, yeah? What are you guys doing? This is definitely gonna like totally fail and Ethereum's gonna dump. And Vitalik was like, no, 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 I think it will pump. Huh? And I was like, okay, Vitalik, I betcha. But I'm kind of a Bitcoin maxi here, so I don't, I don't wanna like, I don't have either. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bet you with that. And he was like, well, I mean, I'm a pretty rich guy, right? I was a Bitcoiner at some point, I still Bitcoin. So he agreed that we do a bet in Bitcoin. So we both came up with, with two Bitcoin, yeah. And we were like, we agreed like, okay, if Ethereum pumps, Vitalik would get everything as in four. And if it dumps, I would get four. Okay, we put it in a multi-seek, put it on chain. And let's say if Ethereum actually dumped, I got the four Bitcoin. Wait, how, how, how did we agree? Like how, how, how would we agree that it dumped? How would we enforce this? How would we enforce that bit, like Bitcoin doesn't have an opcode for Ethereum dumped? doesn't work, right? <laughs> so <coughs> how would we do this? Okay, there's a third party involved in a DLC setup. That's called the Oracle. Here I'm using the logo of Crystal Bull, which is actually an Oracle. More about that later. And that Oracle thing comes like it says, uh, okay, dumped. Gives you a signature. This is actually a transaction. Dalek and me came up with both transactions before. So we kind of like defined spending conditions for said multisig. We can say, okay, it dumped. We can also say it pumped. So the Oracle ca could announce either thing, right? Now the question is how do you trust the Oracle? More on that later. Let's talk about what I can do with the DLC. You kind of already see if it's, it's kind of a bet in the future, right? So you can pretty much depict any betting solution where you wait for a future event to happen. It can be sports betting, political, weather, as long as you can find an Oracle. The thing is, you always have to find an oracle that attests to something happening in the real world, right? One thing <coughs> that's pretty easy to depict and like nice is um, price movement bets, options, futures, CFDs, also called derivatives. Now I'm gonna go on with a bit more complex example. We're gonna dive deep into that. CFDs, contracts for difference. What is a contract for difference? You open a position at the current price, you can take Bitcoin USD, Ethereum USD, whatever you want. If you open a long position, you kind of bet on the price appreciating. If you open a short position, you bet on the price depreciating. If you are in the long position and the price appreciates, you make a profit. If it depreciates, you make a loss. Same the other way around. Now the CFD has an additional thing that's called perpetual. BitMEX, for example, calls it perpetual swaps, for those who know that. Um, so the position can be closed by the user at any point. So when I open it here, and the price moves around, I can decide to close it here, I can decide to close it here, right? So I'm kind of in control when to close it as well. Keep that in mind. Now we have the example with Vitalik and me again. And we are looking at how we can build an actual DLC solution. So that this DLC in the end is the transaction setup. We have already talked about that, right? Now instead of saying black and white, Ethereum pumps or dumps, it's a bit boring, right? So we can actually find intervals. We can say anything that is below 800, like if you see the current ETH USD price is around 1,500, let's say it drops below 800, I would get everything. If it goes above 4,000, Vitalik will get everything. In between, I define intervals. Then I create transactions for that. So we have four Bitcoin here. We can define split conditions, basically. So you'd come up with a lot, a lot, a lot of transactions. This is highly simplified. In the end, it would be like thousands of transactions that could be spending from said multi-sig, where we now lock the money. 
and you come up with these transactions together with the Oracle. And according to what the Oracle later tests, only one of these transactions will become active. So we lock up the four Bitcoin. Now let's have a, a quick look on non-custodial trade execution <coughs> and what it actually means to do that. The DLC is the transaction setup, right? It's like, you can also call it transaction scheme if you want. Similar to the Lightning Network also having transaction schemes. Then you have something like chain interaction. I call it chain interaction here. You can call it chain monitoring. There's all kinds of things. Somehow you have to know what's going on on chain <coughs> because it's actually happening on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? You have the multi-sig there. You have like the other party doing stuff. <coughs> when you publish transactions, you have to monitor that this is ongoing. So you actually have to be online to also know what's ongoing on chain. Let's have a look on settling with the Oracle. Say the Oracle announces a price of 830, so Ethereum would dump. That is in the interval between 8 and 900, and that would unlock these transactions if you remember that this was actually the interval. <coughs> and I get a signature from the Oracle that unlocks these transactions. I, have I can, like, both of us can actually then publish this transaction on chain, and it will distribute the money. Both of us can enforce this. Both of us have this whole thing, right? Both of us store this off-chain, and only one transaction goes on-chain. It's also really good for privacy purposes, generally visibility on-chain, because the setup is actually just a multi-sig and a transaction spending permit. Now let's look at, like, I kind of already said that, like, you could say that this is just, the enforcement is just a backup solution, right? I could now say, well, hey Vitalik, um, the Oracle did announce that, and we know that the split is one to three, so why don't we agree on creating a collaborative transaction together that might be cheaper than that one, might be faster than that one, yeah? and we just publish that. Otherwise, I can go and use the Oracle and force you to do it anyway. So we can do it cheaper. We can just settle. That's a collaborative settlement where we just create the transaction together. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there is, that you cannot collaborate with the other party in a non-custodial setup, but there always has to be enforcement so you can force them to do it. Obviously, we can also say if the Oracle even has not announced yet, we can still collaboratively settle. We could, for example, say, hey, um, I don't want to do this anymore. He also says, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. We can just go for 2-2 again and just split it up, right? Transaction fees are obviously not part of the mix here, but I mean, they, they would be there, so you would pay for that, like fractions. <coughs> and you can do this any, at any point. Like if you take the CFD solution, right, price moves, you can always agree to collaboratively settle according to a certain price, saying the Oracle would later announce this, like anyway, might not deviate much, let's do it now. Now, <coughs> let's go further and say, mm, let's say we have a, like a scenario where Vitalik and we betted, and after, like we betted for 24 hours, let's say, after 24 hours, it actually didn't move much. Yeah. So we're kind of like, well, this was pretty useless. If we settle this now, we kind of just burn transaction fees. We could also say, I actually won a little bit. Let's say Ethereum dumped a tiny bit, but I think it's actually going to go down further. But it didn't do that in the first 24 hours. So I could say, Vitalik, I actually kind of won, yeah? so I would get a tiny fraction from you. But how about you pay me a bit of interest and we keep this going? So you get a chance for the next 24 hours that it goes up, I get a chance for the next 24 hours that it goes down. Or <coughs> so we can add layer two, in the sense of like, similar to the Lightning Network again, you create a new set of transactions that potentially deviates, so you can depict interest, for example, and add punish transaction or transactions, so you can invalidate the old state. So, sorry, oops, a bit jumpy. Um, so that if somebody would publish, like Vitalik, for example, would publish something of the old state, I can immediately take the whole money, punishing him. And obviously you can do this forever. And that's how you can make this whole thing perpetual, moving on. And now we actually have non-custodial CFD trading. Yeah, you have a perpetual CFD trading solution. Of course, the chain interaction now includes looking for previous state as well. Like the whole setup is somewhat complex, but I mean, it's totally doable. <coughs> now let's zoom out a bit. Let's go for actual peer-to-peer -peer trading. Let's say we take the chain interaction and the DLC that we just talked about, pack it into a nice software, and we add discovery. <coughs> then 
then we add, well, is it jumpy? Yeah. Then we add a user interface, and we pack this into a nice software that I can use. And then Vitalik can use that as well. But since I have discovery now, it can also be buff Vitalik, Vitalik's brother. Or anybody. I don't have to know them anymore. Since I have this setup with the DLC here, I basically can enforce. So I don't have to know my trading party anymore. The Oracle is obviously involved, and I still have to trust the Oracle. The Oracle is a fully trusted party. Cannot really go around that. But the Oracle is also public. If the Oracle cheats, it will be immediately, possi like immediately possible to see that it cheats. And you can oust the Oracle being like, this Oracle cheated. Additionally, you can add multiple oracles. And the way that I imagine this in the future is not a two out of three or a five out of seven. You say, okay, five, it has the same thing, and the other two don't matter anymore. But maybe 70 out of 100. You can go pretty high with this. Obviously, you will have to store more and more and more and more transactions because off-chain. Because the more oracles you have, the more transactions you have to set up because it's all different signatures. But it's definitely possible if you give it a bit of time if you let the whole space evolve a bit. And then we reach this. Then we reach what we want. Peer-to-peer -peer trading, non-custodial. And you know what? It's actually already possible. Those solutions are probably not perfect yet. They're all pretty techy. <laughs> I mean, we are techies, right? Uh, there's Ichisats, that's what we are building. Um, and that actually is a CFT solution. So what I showed you now is pretty much what we are doing. We are on Umbrella, Raspberry Blitz, and Docker. There's Atomic Finance, probably have heard of them. They actually have an app. They have a closed beta at the moment, you can register. I can highly recommend doing that. They're really cool people. They do covered call options. So their product is a bit different than what I described. Then you have Shortbits, they're pretty famous in the space. Chris from Shortbits is pretty famous in the space as well. And they focus on Oracles. They have Crystal Bull, that's like the logo I kept using which is an oracle that anybody can run. For example, Luna, who puts sports betting there, actually. <coughs> it's La Liga, I think. They actually have an oracle explorer where you can see what he puts there. Like, oh, I said that now. Privacy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can also try that on Umbrel. They're also planning on moving their wallet there. And last but not least, the example that I was using, it's not just for fun, because on Ichisats, we recently launched it last week, uh, this week, I think, actually. You can short the merge. You can also long the merge if you want, but you generally can bet on the ETHUSD price with your Bitcoin. So you can actually use your Bitcoin to bet on Ethereum moving around. Short the merge. Thank you. Cool, cool, cool. Boom, boom. I didn't move. I didn't move that much. Usually, I move more around and check, like check. stumble over tables. You know. <laughs> check, check. So, in order to avoid oracles playing out just the same as custodians, and you know, um, you know, collaborating with your counterparty against you to take the money, you know, there are going to have to be various solutions for how you choose an oracle, and various solutions for like selecting and managing multiple oracles. Are there any projects like right now that are addressing tho those specific issues? Yes. Um, basically, if you look at, um, yeah, I'll go back one slide. Does it really? Hello. If you if you look at Shortbits, for example, they definitely work on that. But the whole DLC spec also works on that. So if you're like more technical focused and you want to go to GitHub and have a look, there's huge discussions around that. There's also ways, I mean, like you can you can talk to Tierra as well, like um, Martin Thierry, who um, they have Fuji, like they recently launched it, which is basically not directly on, on Bitcoin. It, it, it builds on, on top of Liquid. But they also talk about oracles where you actually have an obfuscated like kind of like input. Like so you don't, you can build oracles in a way so that the oracle actually doesn't know what it attests to. If you wanna go even further, there's Lloyd Fournier, for example. We work together with him as well, and he's currently running our Oracle. He's quite famous in, in the technical space. Um, he's working on that like research towards like kind of like using an Oracle in a way so that the Oracle actually doesn't know what you attest to. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. In in general, 
I see oracles, like, there's a difference between being somebody famous and running an oracle, right? Or somebody known in the community and running an oracle. That's kind of like the reputation model that we currently have. So at the moment, this is actually quite centralized. One has to be aware of that. But if the oracle would cheat, it would be somebody in the community that is well known that cheated. So I would say it's unlikely that it happens, but it's obviously a, a problem to some extent, right? Somebody could like take that guy hostage or whatever, right? So it's, it's quite centralized at the moment. But in the future with solutions where the Oracle wouldn't, for example, know what, you, what it attests to, you drive this further how it's being more decentralized. Are any other projects specifically trying to address reputation related to this? Because I, I, every, I agree and understand everything you're saying, but in the end, you can't really tell if two Oracles aren't the same Oracle. And so establishing a reputation becomes tricky. Uh, maybe the yes. both, both <coughs> Oracles are getting their price from Bitfinex and not two different places, you know? I think the honest answer to the question is not at the moment in the current like solutions out there that are being set up, like that are currently set up, but it's definitely going to be addressed in the future. It's like any DLC solution has this on their roadmap. The question is just when do you address it and how do you address it? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for the talk. Oh, sorry. Mine is a question about... Um, the perpetual contract you explained? Yeah. Let's so see. So when you have, okay. Should I go there? This one. <laughs> yeah. So let's say I long a position. Yeah. Or short it, it doesn't matter. When okay. I'm out of my reach, because I, I locked some sets on the yeah. contract, right? When my position is already, mm, how to say, now centralized trading platforms will um, liquidate you yep. if you go run out of Liquidation can happen here too. Yeah, and I wanted to ask if you can explain more about the liquidation. Okay. Because <laughs> in the how I understand it is if you lock your sats, yeah. then you should provide more liquidity in order to not be liquidated, right? So first, question what happened with the old contract with the sats locked and you have to add up the new sats right so you have to mm. yeah that's, that's a good question um, in our current solution you basically can't add it's a very simple answer so you would just get liquidated so you have yeah no seriously that's 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 a simple answer in the future there might be a setup where you like can potentially like if if you would add like further things to Bitcoin, like in certain opcodes, you could probably depict this in a different way. But with what we currently had, have, it's not fully possible. Theoretically, if you lift this on layer two, like the complete solution, because our solution is currently like on layer one, right, with a layer two protocol to do the perpetual part. But like this, this multi-sig doesn't change. So you always kind of build on top of this, right? Um, if you would change this to have like a channel, you could potentially manage it different, but that's future music. Um, that's not fully fleshed out yet. So at the moment, <coughs> if you, you have to be risk aware. If you go very risky and then you want to add to the position, you just can't. You will be get liquidated. <coughs> Maybe one last question. Oh yeah. So uh, since the oracle is uh, is ju just uh, public, how is it uh, rewarded so that it's incentivized to stay honest uh, in the long term? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, how do you pay the, the oracle so that it's a, it has a revenue stream that is incentivized to, to stay honest? The oracle? Yeah. The oracle is curr currently not getting paid. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the community if the oracle should get paid, um, because with that you could in incentivize it, but I'm not sure it's a good incentive. Um, the, the Oracle is like, at the moment, it's more a philosophical thing, I would say. And it's also a philosophical discussion in the end. Like if you should run an Oracle for money, because that would actually make it attackable in different ways. So I'm not sure the Oracle should get incentivized with money. Maybe you can incentivize it differently. Okay. Does that answer the question somehow? Um, yeah, I guess. Okay. <laughs> That's the current situation. But like, if you want to look like, people always like, in these presentations, people usually focus totally on the Oracle. And I say it's, it's quite 
new, like give it some time and like there will be solutions for the Oracle to evolve. Y you can make Oracles more decentralized. You know, you, you usually you have shades of decentralization. So it, it's not just like it's, it's, it's like full decentralization immediately happen. Usually this kind of starts and it's, it's a journey. And for the Oracle, it is still a journey. This is not fully decentralized yet, but it can be. And the, incentiv the incentivization is like part of that kind of like, how do you bring this in a setup that works? Okay, so that was great. Uh, let's give a nice round of applause for <laughs> Daniel. And now, keep it for a second. And uh, now I want to invite uh, another friend of mine, Keto Miner. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's give him another applause. Nice. Hi. And there are seats here in front, so please come. Hi, I'm Brod. Okay, so uh, I'm going to invite you to the boring world of system administration. It's a totally different subject. Um, so when Max asked me to, to talk for about Tiffany Badger 2022, I didn't know what I would be talking about, and then Bitcoin Core 23 happened, and you'll see the relation between this talk and Core 23. Um, what I do, I do Nordo. It's uh, full nodes in a box. We also host infrastructure. I'm also doing host for coins. It's an anonymous DPS service, uh, which gets me in trouble regularly, but I'm dealing with it. Um, okay. So, uh, when Bitcoin Core 23 was released, uh, we wanted, obviously, to update it on our devices. And I noticed that it has a single PGP signature file, which is massive. It contains like um, 30 or 40 signatures, most of which uh, you can find the keys on the key servers, but some you can't. And uh, actually, the problem is that when you want to verify the signatures programmatically with GPG, it will not return zero unless you have all the signatures checked. What I didn't know, that <laughs> I discovered it during preparing the slides, is that there is actually a repository with all the separate signatures, so there is a way around that. But it was a good idea for a talk anyway. I also noticed that in the Bitcoin community, we use private and public keys every day to sign transactions, but actually many people don't use or don't know how to use PGP or even what it is. So just a quick reminder, PGP is a encryption and signing uh, tool, uh, which was made in 91. Uh, you generate a keeper uh, protected with a passphrase. Some recipient has also a keeper. You use the public key of your recipient to encrypt the message. The recipient uses the private key to decrypt it. Uh, you can optionally uh, sign the message with your private key. And then when the recipient decrypts, they can verify that uh, your signature matches your public key. And of course, you can also use it only to sign, which is what is used for signing software packages, mostly. And actually not the packages themselves, but the 
uh, the checksums of the packages that will build in that later. And of course, you can use multiple keys. You can encrypt like for 10 different recipients and each of one, each of them can decrypt uh, the, the message. So, uh, yeah, I somehow made transition to work, but whatever. In the 2000s, you were having your, uh, your PGP key, you were having a bunch of beers with your friends, and you ended up with uh, your key signed by these friends. That was called a key signing party. Uh, nowadays, uh, people meet around beers and it generates shit friends instead. So we'll try to fix that and actually do key signing parties during the conference. Uh, why people did that? Uh, simply because if I just if you just download a random key on the internet to verify some package, you have no idea that this key actually belongs to the person who says it belongs to. Uh, so, or you're trusting a third-party service like GitHub or Keybase that is actually the repository or the account of the person, or you can just have this key signed by 10, 50, 100 different people who attest that this person is actually the per the key belongs actually to the person who says it belongs to. How package signing works, it's very simple. We make a checksum, usually SHA-256, of the package, and then this checksum is signed with a private key of a maintainer. Um, for Bitcoin Core, there is this, in the main place you download the packages, uh, there is one single file with all the signatures inside. And for example, for LND, you have separate files, which is much more convenient for for programmatic verification. So you, we actually embed all the keys of the pick of the signees and we check all the signatures before we, we install the package. So how package verification works, um, we, well, what I just said, we verify that the, um, that the signature actually matches the key and then that the package matches the, um, the checksum and then we know that we have a good package. And this is how it. Let's see which one is on there. This is how it looks when you do it uh, in a terminal. I have my LND. I have the uh, manifest, which is the file with the sharp signature uh, checksums, and I have the PGP signature here. I download from GitHub user content the key of one of the signees. I verify with GPG that the key is fine. Then I verify that the checksum matches the package and then I can unpack my package. And um, yeah, so uh, there were some dramatic effects because it was appearing piece by piece, but the, the player doesn't support it apparently, so you will miss <laughs> some of it. Uh, this is just a zoom in on the same. Uh, this is an example with Bitcoin Core. So here we can see that there are many, 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 many signatures and for some of them, if I grab for good signatures, I have the good signature from the person. Uh, some One of these keys is, is actually expired currently on the key server, so someone has an expired key and is still signing the packages. Uh, and the problem, as I said before, is that if I use this and I don't have all the, all the keys in my keychain, GPG will not return zero, so I can't programmatically verify that the package is good. Um, I looked at a few implementations of uh, Bitcoin nodes in the box or software distributions, how they verify the signatures. This is one of them. Uh, this one builds a Docker image for Bitcoin Core 22. It actually lists all the fingerprints of all the keys to download and check. It downloads the keys from key servers from two different ones because all keys are not on all key servers and that's a big problem right now. Uh, it checks that the list of the keys in the keychain matches the keys it's expecting and then it's uh, downloading Bitcoin Core and verifying. So this works for 22. It doesn't work for 23 because all the keys are, some of the keys are not on any key server. This is another one. Uh, so this is Raspberry Leads. They have chosen to verify only one key, um, which is the Vladimir's key. So they download the key and then they verify, they grab for good signature in the output. 
And first, when you read this, you say, okay, if I trick somehow GPG to just output good signature anywhere, yeah, but I actually verify that it matches this key, so this is fine. This is how we do it. Uh, it's a trade-off. We are importing a lot of keys, and we are checking that at least 10 are fine. Of course, if 10 people call themselves good signatures, good signature, this shouldn't really work anymore. So don't do that. Um, part two is, uh, so now I'm really going into basic Linux stuff and how I imagine people could attack uh, people using Bitcoin and, and the wallet software as a, as a cover for that. So some of the, some of the techniques I would imagine is obviously insert malicious code into a wallet, but it's open source so anybody can verify. Yeah, right, no, actually if you look at the historical code review of the Linux kernel itself, this is the percentage of coverage of the code review inserted in the kernel. So open source doesn't guarantee you that anybody will read your code and check that there, is, there isn't anything malicious in it. You can think about the OpenSSL bug a few years ago, for example. It was a single character and it was screwing up everything. Compromise the verification and extraction chain, like GPG or TAR. This is what I will be focusing on here. Trick the user into running a compromised version of the command. Same. And yeah, one uh, YouTuber, ex uh, Microsoft engineer, I, I like very much. It's uh, Dave's Garage, the channel. He made a video about uh, some of these issues, and I encourage you to, to watch it. The QR code links to the video. So, um, one big problem I see with what we are doing now is we are checking the checksum of the tar archive. But does this say anything about what I extracted here? I checked the signatures. But what I didn't know is that I have a malicious version of the tar command that I just wrote for this presentation on my computer. So this one simply checks if I'm trying to unpack LND and it replaces LND with a malicious binary. So one big problem and one very easy improvement we could probably do as a community is to start signing what is in the packages and not the packages themselves. And yeah, so um, what I actually did here is just, if it detects LND, it replaces it, and if not, it just acts as a normal tar comment. So it's very hard to detect by a normal user. Another way, how many times did you install something with just npm install and some fancy tool because it helps your Bitcoin a lot? So I created the super Bitcoin tool, SBT, npm install. Okay, it doesn't do much except print you the message, do not use this tool because I obviously don't want people to actually use it. And what it does, it replaces LND with a malicious version of LND. So this is very easy. Every day you're doing some npm minus g install on your computer. You install all, all, all kinds of software, you probably with zero code review. And uh, yeah, any of that can be malicious. Uh, also, one thing I'm not talking, I don't have in my slides, but the, a very easy attack is the clipboard of your computer. If you copy any key or any, uh, any private key or any, even just as a privacy problem, any public key, any program running on your computer has access to that. And unless you're running, uh, using for example an iPhone, which tells you that an application access the, you actually get a notification every time the, an application accesses the clipboard, you have no idea what's going on. And any, you can assume that any program running on your computer is actually looking at what you have in your, in your buffer. So yeah, wha one thing is on, on, a, on a Unix system, there is the, the path variable which defines in which order the, uh, the system will be looking at folders to find the program you're trying to execute. 
And actually, for very historical reasons, the most non-system paths are first, because the system assumes that if you installed a version of something in these uh, like user folders, uh, which is USL local uh, slash OPT, uh, you did it for a reason and you want actually to use that instead of the system provided version. And uh, unfortunately, if you look at, uh, do I have it here? No, not on this slide. But yeah, uh, so I'm actually not replacing LND, I'm just putting a new version of LND in a different folder, which has precedence over the, the normal installation path. And many other vectors. When you do apt get install whatever, uh, by default dpkg checks the signatures of the packages, but it doesn't check which signature uh, it, it's using. So if you have any gpg key, and it can be a malicious one in your keychain, and uh, you install a package from a malicious repository, uh, it will actually check out and be accepted by the system. So, for example, uh, the Kicksonians repository, I asked him to add this in the instructions, signed by. This allows you to say that for this repository, I only trust this precise key. And that's also something everybody should be doing. Like, if you add any third-party repository to your Linux system, always add signed by to, be, to make sure that the key you're checking when you install package is actually the correct key and not just any key present on your system. Random Docker images used for building. Many distributions use uh, use Docker, and uh, they just pull like the latest Debian or Alpine or whatever from from the public uh, registries. Uh, that's a very good attack vector because uh, you have no idea what is actually in these images. Uh, similarly, or identically named tools or libraries. This is a very big issue. Uh, and we've seen that uh, yesterday in Lisa's presentation, she used LN as an alias for the Lightning client. LN is the link comment on Linux, so you can't use it anymore if you do that. Um, yeah, so use stupid names, but just don't name, reuse known stuff. Um, and yeah, uh, when you download your Debian, ISO file, do you download it from the main server or do you download it from some random mirror that you know nothing about? So at least download the checksums from another place and compare. Always use absolute paths for running critical commands. Uh, that's, that mitigates the path attack, vector attack. Um, don't install stuff because they're new, shiny and hype. They probably have no code review at all, and you have no idea what's in there. Sign the actual binaries instead of signing the archives. That's really, please do it. <laughs> uh, don't install stuff with npm minus g as root. Uh, you don't imagine how many installation instructions tell you to do that. Uh, it's totally unnecessary. You don't need all the users of your system to access your uh, balance of Satoshi's command, so just install it as the user which will be running it, and without minus G. And don't install stuff pulling hundreds of dependencies from random maintainers, like you know this picture, node modules, the heaviest uh, object in the universe. My stupid five lines code for this demo pulls clo near 200 dependencies, and it's using only one library. And of course, I have no idea what these 200 dependencies do. All of them could be malicious. Another one is when you use GPG for code verification, don't use the default keychain. You can specify a uh, uh, specific uh, sec ring and pub ring when, when you import and check the signatures. So that's a good thing to do. Just import the signatures before checking the code and dispose of these sec rings after. 
use Tripwire or SysTrack. These are tools that do checksums of uh, files on your computer and alert you if these files change. So by default, that it does it for like critical configuration files of the Linux system, but add your Bitcoin D, add your LND, add your all your critical stuff in the list of the files it will be monitoring. Uh, Ideally, that's something which is long lost. Uh, when we were installing a Linux system 20 years ago, we were like having 10 different partitions with very specific permissions, like slash home doesn't need the exec permissions, uh, slash TMP could be mounted with no exec as well. Uh, and all the, you could put all your Bitcoin related binaries in a read only file system and remount it as you write when you need it, for example. And you can also use chatera plus i, immutable, uh, but that can be overridden by root, so if you're installing crap as root, you can override this anyway. Um, what I would like to see more also is have a firmware approach uh, with the base OS and Bitcoin tools embedded in the read-only image and then all the data in a separate read-write partition. And maybe we should start working of s on something like Apple and Microsoft now have that any software you run is signed and there is a pre-flight check every time you run it. Uh, we obviously would have to do it in a decentralized way without trusting a third party authority. But yeah, that's maybe some research to, to be done. And that's it. That's, that's a lot of questions, not many answers. So. so we have time, I think, for one or two questions. Yep. Very good talk, thank you. Uh, I have uh, two points and one question. So uh, one uh, one thing is that uh, in my experience the Ubuntu key server is pretty reliable. I never I don't remember it failing any time. So that that one is fine. But al I also hard code key server Ubuntu keys. So so that's one. Uh, another one is that newer Androids also show you when you are pasting or something. And the question is I didn't understand the, the tar attack actually because like if if the I don't know if you assume that tar binary is compromised, but if, if I can compromise tar binary, then I could as well compromise GPG command, right? Yeah, of course. I just the tar is a very simple command as far as the output of the command is concerned. So it's easier to make a malicious tar which looks normal than a malicious GPG that looks normal. Also, but yeah, you could like totally replace it the verification <laughs> code and just say good every time. To uh, what what I would do as an attacker, I, I would just fi find the place where it outputs uh, good, and, and check if if the si uh, if the fingerprint is actually my own fingerprint, my of attacker, and then replace it. That's yeah, yeah, ju just I one example. Do. I mean, the all, all of this actually comes from the rootkit idea. Yeah. You, like you could totally compromise the system and just run a completely different version of everything, and okay. nobody would notice. Uh, because like. My approach is actually the opposite, like sign the whole tar, because uh, there are like weird uh, attacks against tar itself, or uh, rather the file format is kind of shitty. So uh, it's better to sign whole archive, because uh, at least it hopefully the maintainers are not att attacking you, and so uh, you prevent these weird attacks where you would first have to unpack it, where you are vulnerable, and then you verify. Well, so you could just not pack it at all. Oh, that's also a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, my my talk uh, will be about various vulnerabilities, including in in package verification in uh, in LND, where they had uh, like several vulnerabilities. I'm not sure if if you've seen that. I made a pull request uh, fixing them. So, if you are interested, maybe maybe this is something for you or anyone okay. else. One more there, okay. So you said, um, you know, uh, don't install new shiny software that's probably got zero code review. Um, 
but what's your best approach to mitigate, I mean, you want to try out the new software or you know, there are other things that have some of the issues that you've outlined. Uh, my, my approach is always like just use a separate device and that's about the best solution, but what do you think if, it, you know, you want to try the software out but you're worried about some of these security concerns, how do you kind of find a nice middle ground? Well, it, it f first of all, if the software in question is actually using your hot wallet, you can't try it on a different device than your wallet works, so that's it. And, I and, and even if it can access that remotely, it doesn't change any problem because it can still be malicious and just take all your funds. My approach is clearly just don't sacrifice security for convenience and even if you would really have to try some new shiny tools, just wait until some people who actually do some code review do it before you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ghetto Miner. It was <laughs> amazing. Okay, and now we're gonna have our first panel. So I'm inviting uh, to our huge stage, uh, Matthew and everybody else. Now they will do the... Uh, I'll ask and also I'll, I'll bring the mics. This one, come here. Test, test. Sharon, Mike. All right, everybody. This is the trading panel. I presume since you're in this room, you are really interested in trading and uh, want to get down to the nitty gritty. But I was joking with the uh, panelists before, um, you know, before we started that the last trading panel at Honey Badger, which I hosted, uh, basically the conclusion at the end of it is don't trade. <laughs> so uh, I presume that you are in this because you actually want to trade. But anyway, uh, before we get into that, let's do some quick introductions, and then maybe our, if our uh, speakers want to talk about if you should trade or not as a broad, broad topic, that would be nice as well, so. Hello, I'm Ambroid. Uh, I basically crash the trading panel every year on Baltic Honey Badger, so you might know me from there. Um, usually hungover, but this time I'm sober somehow. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the only shit coiner that's allowed on stage at this conference. <laughs> um, yeah, th th that's me. Uh, that's been consistently me for a couple years now. Hey guys, my name is Nick, uh, CEO and founder of Bitcoin Reserve, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Talked with the guys beforehand and had some really quality insights here, so enjoy. Um, hey guys, my name is Martins. Uh, I'm from uh, co-founder of Gravity Team. Uh, we're market makers in the space, and to answer the question if people should trade, I guess they should, but they obviously got to know what they're doing, right? So it's everyone's, else, everyone's own responsibility. Hello, everyone. I'm Ricardo. I'm taking care of cybersecurity at Bitfinex. And I'm, and I'm thinking, right, so how can they trade if they, like, lost every private key in, like, in a boating accident? So that's, that's even, like, a, a different level for most of the people out here. All right, we can explore some of that. Okay, and I'm Matthew Mazinskis, by the way, uh, host Crypto Voices podcast. Um, and yeah, I'll try to be a good host here and not talk too much. So let's just get started here. The panels can talk back and forth. C5 versus DeFi, 
trying to increase your stack, what is the best way to, uh, to try to do that in space? Okay, so the best way to do it is not to trade. But <laughs> no, uh, on a serious note, um, everyone should try their hand at trading um, just with a limited amount and to see what it's like uh, to find out that it's not for them and leave it to others. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's an important experience because you find out how liquidity works um, and it's an important aspect to crypto in general, right? Everyone had to buy their first Bitcoin. So to end, well, everyone, most people had to buy their first Bitcoin or their first stable coin or whatever. So when you start in crypto, you are already immersed uh, in trading against your will, right? So um, there are just so many pitfalls to that that nobody realizes. My, my first buy of Bitcoin was through HitBTC. And then later I found out that they're this scammy piece of shit exchange that nobody should use, right? And everything went through fine. A SEPA transfer, uh, no KYC, nobody gave a shit back then. Uh, so. Um, how do you navigate as a new user uh, entering the crypto space, right? Because uh, either you're barraged with a shitload of KYC or is it even a trustworthy exchange? I mean, th that's a really good question. And I think what's really important to understand, which most people don't, is that KYC is actually a spectrum. So a lot of people think, oh, okay, it's distributed exchange, there's absolutely no KYC, and then there's something like Coinbase, which I have to provide my entire documentation and the name of my firstborn, right? But in reality, what you have to understand is that there are different regulations in different areas and geographies that actually force the companies themselves to reveal certain information to their regulators, as well as other three-letter agencies, versus other jurisdictions where that type of compliance is different. So what's very important is when you're looking for an exchange to trade on, when you're talking about centralized exchanges, is you have to ask the question of what is my data and what am I giving and where it's being stored and how that data is communicated to the regulators. So for example, let's take Coinbase, right? Uh, recently there was a report out that said that Coinbase has to officially file to the IRS on behalf of the individuals that are actually trading on their exchange. So that's one three-letter body that your information is going to fully, and that's not only your personal information, but this is also your trade data. This is all the financial aspects of your trading history involved there as well. Versus if you're looking for a, another jurisdiction somewhere, say, in the EU, uh, let's take, for example, our jurisdiction, I'm very familiar with it out of Estonia, uh, with Bitcoin Reserve, that's the FIU. When you're talking about that particular regulator, there is no discourse between the company and the regulators themselves on an active basis streaming information to the regulator. So if there is something that's actually going to happen in terms of a full request for information, then the regulators themselves have to actually have a subpoena, meaning that somebody has to go to a court in Estonia to be able to open that lit and then send that to us and then we will, of course, you know, have to abide by the regulation and deliver it. So as a result, what you have to understand is that because there are so many different aspects of what KYC information is collected, how it is stored, and to whom it is communicated, one of the first questions that you should ask in the exchange is, what are you doing with my information? How is it used? And who are you communicating it to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And to continue on, on your point, I think there's definitely a trend towards more regulation, obviously, uh, that's happening over the time. And and every country reacts differently. Um, but yeah, if you look uh, globally, there are certain countries that are actually moving very quickly towards regulation and implementing things such as travel rule as well. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, Japan or Korea or Canada, uh, they have implemented travel rule, which basically means if you want to send your Bitcoin outside of uh, the exchange, you actually have to know who the recipient is. The ex exchange has to know it. It's like almost the system becomes pretty much the same like existing banking system where you have an existing SWIFT system where you have to always enter the credentials of the recipient and uh, have to know who the recipient is. So yeah, um, the party is getting a little bit less fun in, in, in that way because yeah, it's much getting much more regulated. So there's the also distinction between the centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges becomes um, a little bit more um, significant because one has uh, one has more and mo more and more KYC and more and more information needs to be presented versus the other one is still kind of like uh, laying in the dark. 
You know, I'm thinking also that KYC is like a huge responsibility. I mean, for a, for a company to collect all that, I mean, all this data, I mean, we have to make sure that we are, you know, collecting it in such a way where we will not experience data breaches. If we so, uh, will experience something, we have to, uh, to, you know, be ready for it. So, and, and I think that you should ask uh, yourself, uh, why are you using like a specific exchange right now? And what are the alternatives? And you, you should think about like security features, privacy features, uh, availability, uh, confidentiality, and, and all these things, because actually there's a, a huge privacy problem by using centralized exchanges in general. Um, so yeah, I mean, take a look at the documentation and uh, you know, draw your conclusions. So my understanding of GDPR is that as an exchange, you shouldn't even store user data from KYC, and you should just offboard it to a uh, third party. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, G GDPR says like privacy by default and privacy by design, right? So, and I'm still thinking that in Europe there are no exchanges that are compliant to GDPR. I mean, I mean, it's just like my idea because every time that, for example, you are like uh, depositing uh, bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies or withdrawing uh, them from an exchange, actually you have like a, um, um, a really track of your old finances. So, as an exchange, basically, we have a data that we can use to track users back and forth, and this is not really private, right? I mean, I, I don't think it's private. So, um, for example, in Bitfinex, what uh, we are also doing is like uh, allowing, uh, using Lightning Network or Liquid, and this adds like a layer of uh, privacy to our, to our users. And it's also like reducing the, ca the amount of data that we're collecting and that we should you know, put it in a secure place, right? So, wha what, I'm what I think that uh, really, I hope that uh, exchanges out there will start uh, also providing new features and new ways to like uh, allow uh, deposits and withdrawals with mm -hmm. new technologies and new features. Um, but again, at the end, it's all about education. I mean, final users and users should educate uh, themselves about these topics. Um, unfortunately, as humans, we tend to um, like think about security when we are hacked and think about privacy when uh, we are like victims of a, um, I don't know, data breach and things like that. And it's bad. We should avoid those issues, right? So it's the same. Like people are installing safe uh, locks and cameras in their homes after they are like victims of a, of a thief. And this is crazy, right? I mean, we should avoid it. Actually, I got a question uh, to you, Ricardo, uh, on the note of a Lightning Network. Because uh, I know, yeah, Bitfinex has adopted Lightning net Network and offering the possibility to send around uh, crypto using it. Uh, and it's one of the very few exchanges that actually does that. It's also Kraken that also supports it. But uh, most of the major big, and also OKX, uh, but most of the big exchanges are actually totally not doing that. Uh, like you look at Binance, Coinbase, FTX, or anyone else, they're just keeping silent about this technology that is already there for four years, actually. And for us as market makers, we ac spend uh, a lot of money every month, like um, yeah, hundreds of thousands, actually, uh, on, uh, on withdrawal fees. And it's uh, bit just a bit weird to see that uh, exchanges are not, not adopting this and of course you guys are doing it so kudos to you but my question why, why do you think why aren't, why aren't exchanges adopting it is it technically complicated or is it or they don't have incentives for it it's cheaper <laughs> you just offload the withdrawal fees to the user you know fuck the user so yeah well that kind of sucks right I mean there should be some kind of um, user users policy in the, the, the exchanges or yeah, a, a wider discussion around it in, in, in the community because exchanges seem to not really be giving the best uh, services to, to their clients. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's also about usage, right? So, uh, I mean, like technical people are using Lightning like Network and Liquid right now, not like normal people or like, or like, uh, um, like new people coming to the market. So, uh, again, I think that the problem in Bitcoin is that there's no standard, right? So when you're like uh, using Bitcoin, you ha you hear that it's like on chain, liquid, lightning, seg segwit, uproot, and you don't understand anything, right? So I think that uh, Bitcoin has a really huge learning curve, and uh, after a while, you will start using like a network when you are like uh, when you're not afraid, right? Because everyone was afraid of like a network at the beginning, right? I mean, how does it work? What can I do? What about penalty transactions and these things, right? So you have to study, you have to understand how it works, and then when you feel that uh, you are ready to use it, then do it. But again, guys, re remember that also there's also testnet, right? So you can try every tool in Bitcoin, 
for free, basically, without like being afraid of losing money and making mistakes. So yeah, I think that that's a really big uh, like a user's problem because people mm -hmm. they don't know how to use it. They don't know that that it exists basically because uh, it's still like a um, a new new level, right? It's a different level. So they prefer to use like this the like on chain transaction and these things. Actually, one more thing, and and I do have to shill uh, Bitcoin Reserve here, which by the way we're not an exchange, we're an OTC brokerage, but there's absolutely zero withdrawal fees, and we're non custodial, so not your keys, not your coins. Uh, with that having been said, I want to address your question with regards to why not use Lightning. So, for example, we integrated Liquid just recently. We had the choice between of going with Liquid or with Lightning. And once we started to look within the industry of some of the other exchanges and some of the other individuals that were using Lightning on a more deeper scale within their platforms, it starts to become much more complicated from a systems perspective and also from a resource perspective. So we are a startup at the end of the day, and funds are tight. So we have to make sure that our resources are going to the places where they're going to be the found the most valuable. And when you're talking about development resources and maintaining a Lightning node and also everything else that comes along with it, you start to see exponentially increasing costs. And as you were saying, unfortunately, there's just not enough adoption in the space to make that an availability for the end client. So from that perspective, again, some for us, it's a resource constraint. We would absolutely love to do it, and we will, but there also has to be that demand on the other side. So for you, it's also a better product mar fit, market fit, right? Because Liquid is more suited to larger transactions? Or exactly, like yeah. yeah. And the confidential aspect of that yeah. is also yeah. you know, part and parcel of what we try to offer. So how many people here use Lightning? Like, raise your hand. So like, what, 20%? 30? 30? And this is a hardcore Bitcoin conference, right? So there you go. <laughs> well, first of all, I'll say that was even, that was majority with Lightning Amroid <laughs> in this room, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just but, <laughs> well, all right, all right, let's, let's quickly, I want to open up to questions, but really quick here, let's at least get one kind of trading strategy. Of course, not investment advice, stupid, we have to say that, but all right, if we're going to do something in Bitcoin regarding trading, we want to expand our stack. I presume we're talking about BTC-based sort of accounts. We're looking at increasing our Bitcoin with trading anyway. The best way to do that, or a simple way to do that, I guess, is margin. Are there any exchanges you guys would recommend regarding margin? How much margin should we take? Ambroid, you're a pro at this. So leverage, borrowing other people's money to buy more Bitcoin, not investment advice. Tell us what the best way to do it. So I'm a I'm a pro at uh, <laughs> getting margin call. Do you mean <laughs> is that it? No. Um, margin yeah. call is a stop loss. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, sometimes it's cheaper actually. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it depends, right? Uh, on on Bitmex, like you might as well get liquidated if you place your stop at a certain place. Right. I, I, it's cheaper to get liquidated than to get stopped at a uh, like at a certain level. But whatever. Um, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so we talked about, very briefly, we talked about the average leverage, right, uh, And uh, uh, the before the panel. And uh, people just go way too fucking hard with leverage. That <laughs> uh, it just go single digits. I mean, <laughs> just don't be an animal, you know? <laughs> uh, I know it gets exciting with the higher numbers, but um, uh, the average... Leverage on Binance, as far as I know, like throughout, well, since they started their futures, is 20x. And if you think about that, that's just absolutely insane because a very small move gets you liquidated and you just lose all your money because on Binance you lose or all your money by getting liquidated. Whereas on BitMEX, it's right at 70% of uh, the position. So um, uh, use isolated uh, margin, meaning it's only for the given one position that's open and put leverage slider to the left, okay? Uh, <laughs> in the green zone, yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it still gets the results when it gets the results, right? It's just that the downside happens slower if it happens. So I guess it's maybe more emotionally painful to look at the money dwindle away for a, a bit longer time than just it evaporates instantly, and uh, yeah, maybe next trade. So, <laughs> um, so it's about a trade. I, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> uh, so, I guess it's about emotional damage, right? Wh when you trade, uh, you keep getting emotionally damaged over and over again. 
and uh, you either become fine with it or you drink yourself into a stupor and just lose more. I don't know. Uh, it, so uh, I guess. Is that why you were hungover last conference? <laughs> 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 Let's not talk about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Um, um, I just dose it, you know, like uh, uh, slower uh, over a longer time. Like uh, people go on training binges, you know what I mean? Like you lose and then you try to uh, get it all back in the next trade. It, it just. Um, your emotions are d working directly against you, and especially so, the emotions are on leverage when you're trading on leverage. You are most more stressed. Uh, you cannot sleep. You're. It's just more painful. So, just lower the leverage. That would be uh, my take. And regarding the platforms, um, most leverage is gonna be uh, behind KYC, right? So. Um, if you want to stick to non-KYC platforms uh, in terms of uh, leverage, you are going to have to go on Ethereum mo most of the time. As far as I know, the only leverage platform that's marginally Bitcoin uh, related is Sovereign, uh, which is on the RSK sidechain, which is again EVM. So. Um, yeah, um, if you want to do leverage uh, against Bitcoin, it's going to be either KYC or EVM based. So take your poison. So this is a topic that uh, I can talk on for a very long time. And again, I'll, I'll preface this with the exact same thing. This is not financial advice. We're not financial advisors in any way, shape or form. But I know we are um, running pretty short on time. We started late here. So I'll try to summarize it in uh, two general points. Uh, the first and foremost is leverage is a tool, okay? At the end of the day, how much leverage one should take is very individualistic. It depends on your trading strategy, it depends on your time horizon, it depends on a lot of different factors. So there's no one size fits all answer when it comes to leverage itself. Uh, secondly, when you start to zoom out, I think there's a real important distinction to be made between trading and investing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that they are investors when in reality they are actually traders. So when you're talking about investing, Think of real estate. When you're investing into real estate, you're buying that property for the purpose of holding it and then generating revenue from it for a prolonged period of time. Effectively, for life, if you can afford it. That is the true concept of investing. So if you take that with Bitcoin, and again, in my opinion, uh, then what you're doing is you're buying and holding. And you're DCA. That, that is an investor if you're talking about Bitcoin. When you're looking at trading, then even if you're in and out, say, from a bear market to a bull market, Technically, you're still position trading, meaning that your time horizon is in a year or two. You're still not investing. And when you start to go down to the lower time frames, I mean, you have intraday trading, you have scalping, everything else. So from that perspective, actually, that's where the concept of leverage starts to come back in and becomes very important, and specifically how much leverage you use. So personally for myself, what I have seen is the amount of information that is available on exchanges right now, the tools that are available, are making the ability for order flow trading to really start to make a really big impact in the average trader's uh, repertoire of tools. And order flow, for those of you who may not know, is being able to actually read the tape. So this is the orders that are coming in, looking at the order book, the bid into depth, seeing how much of particular trades are sitting on whatever side, and effectively using the flow of the market to then enter and exit positions very, very quickly. And when you're doing that, and I'm talking about very quickly, I'm talking about sometimes maybe five seconds, sometimes even under a minute, right? And with that, you can very well get away with 50x leverage. Right? If your risk parameters are set correctly, and have, you know, at the end of the day, you're not losing more than two, 5% of your total uh, trading account, then that's a viable strategy, that's right? It, it, it's huge, yeah. That's right, so you have to actually take a strategy that works for that. So for example, the, the reality of the situation is that a lot of people, they simply look at their win rate, right? So say you got eight trades that you win, two trades that you lose. 80% of the time, you're likely going to win. And based on that, that's how you're able to set your risk parameters. But the reality of the situation is most professional traders are actually pretty close to 49 uh, or 50-50 split. The difference is, is the winning trades are four or five times in terms of the money that they earn versus the losing trades. And there's a couple of scratch trades there as well. And there's a lot of interesting information that's uh, available in the space and training as well. 
Um, so again, I highly suggest that you guys get educated first on what you want to do, how much you have available to risk, and what strategies you want to employ. Play around on some testnet. Everybody always says that. Never works. Okay, use some real money, because it's actually going to get you a good result in terms of the feelings that you're going to get. And uh, really take it step by step. Yeah. All right, we got to cut it in like 30 seconds, so I'm sorry, guys. Last two panelists, no questions, but just very quickly. Okay, yeah, just to add on top of what the guy said, I think everything about 10x is uh, casino, right? and don't play casino, the house always wins. Um, have to be, uh, leverage is a function of uh, um, volatility of the asset, so you have to look at the volatility of this asset, how fast can it drop in one day, two days, three days, and then uh, adjust your risk parameters um, accordingly. But another thing that I would say that another some more tools that are interesting out in crypto right now is also options. So like maybe if you, for example, sell a put option, it's uh, kind of like placing bid orders uh, deep into the order book, but also getting, uh, getting premium on those bid orders. So you're kind of earning interest on the bid orders that you place. So I think options is also a good, uh, good, good, uh, good instrument to trade at this point. But yeah, not financial advice. Thank you. No questions. No questions. No, no time. Questions We're uh, quite tight. So I'm inviting to our oh, if you can uh, yeah please to the stage to uh, Rahim. So yeah. 